invite you to take your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 91. Psalm 91, in the shadow of the Almighty. When you're studying a passage of Scripture, whether it be a book or whether it be a, um, a chapter, I always encourage my students over the years to look for what you would believe to be the key verse. The key verse. Now, in our first session, we surveyed Psalm 91. The first thing that we observed is that throughout this psalm, the psalmist, though being not disclosed, some believe it's David, others believe it's Moses. But the one thing that we do know for certain is that the psalmist who wrote this psalm, Psalm 91, knew a great deal about the God that he writes about. For within Psalm 91, this psalmist uses four of the most powerful names given of our God in his word. We see the name El Shaddai which speaks of God as the self-existent one. The self-existent one. In the English Bible, he is identified as the Almighty. El Shaddai. But he is also identified as the Most High. El Elyon. The one who is sovereign. The one who has all strength. El Elyon. And then the psalmist recognizes God by the name the Lord, literally Jehovah. Who is Jehovah? He is the great I Am, Jehovah. And then he uses another name for God, and that is the word Elohim, the God who created all things, the Supreme One. And so here we can see very carefully that there is a great knowledge on the part of the author of Psalm 91 concerning God himself. He recognizes that God is self-existent. He recognizes that God is sovereign, that God has all strength. He recognizes that God is the great I Am. He recognizes that God is the Supreme One. Now all of these names of God come into play as the psalmist speaks of a secret place. A secret place. He begins the psalm this way. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So everything is going to be focusing upon what the God of the Bible has provided for those and to those who truly know Him and trust Him. Now with that in mind, if you were to ask me what is the key verse in Psalm 91, I would submit that the key verse is verse 14. Verse 14. Look, if you will, in verse 14. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. So this is the Almighty speaking, and he is addressing the one who is marked out by two things, an attachment and an acknowledgement. Note the attachment. He says, he has set his love upon me. What does it mean to set one's love upon God? It means to cling to or to cleave 
two. And so note, if you will, the one who finds shelter in the secret place, the hiding place, he is the one who has demonstrated a love for God. And God recognizes this because he has set his love upon me. But with this attachment, there is also an acknowledgement. Note that latter part of verse 14. He hath known my name. He hath known my name. Now, I said in our first session that I believe that there are hints in Psalm 91 that would lead us to believing that Moses instead of David, was the author of this psalm. And I think here we have a very important insight. Note, the Almighty speaks of the one who has set his love upon God, but he also speaks of the one who hath come to know his name. Now think with me for a moment. At the time that God is calling Moses to go back to Egypt to face Pharaoh for the purpose of delivering the children of Israel. There at that burning bush, God is making known to Moses what his commission and mission is all about. Moses asks a very important question. He says, in essence, you know, when I go to the people, and even when I stand before Pharaoh, they're going to ask me, who sent me? What do I tell them is your name? And with this, God responds, I am. I am hath sent you. I am Jehovah, Yahweh, God's personal name. And so note, if you will, the Almighty, here in verse 14, designates the one who receives the blessings that are given here in Psalm 91, he designates who this individual would be. It would be the individual who would, number one, set their love upon God, and number two, know God by name. So I think you have an insight here that shows us that uh, Moses could very well be the author of Psalm 91. Now looking at Psalm 91, we are going to divide this psalm into three divisions. We need a dwelling place, a hiding place for three reasons. And there are three clear reasons that are going to be marked out in Psalm 91. Reason number one, we need a secret place in our time of trials. Our time of trials. And the psalmist will speak of this in verses 1 through 4. Verses 1 through 4. The second division moves us from our time of trials to our time of terrors, our time of terrors. And this is uh, verse 5 through verse 10, verse 5 through verse 10. And then the third and final division here in Psalm 91 deals with our time of temptations, our time of temptations. And that is in verse 11 through verse 16. So these are the three things that are set before us by the writer of this psalm.
that calls for our needing a dwelling place under the shadow of the Almighty. So let's look at verses 1 through 4. In our times of trials. In our times of trials. The first thing that we are going to see is this. God is our covering in our time of trials. Therefore, our focus must be faith in God. Faith in God. You see, we're not going to run to God if we do not believe that God truly can be our helper. That He can truly make a difference. Now, note, if you will, verses 1 through 4. In times of trials, the Almighty is our covering. The psalmist writes, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, Jehovah, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, Elohim, in, whom, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover me with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Now I know the word is thee, but I would rather read it with the word me. In my times of trials, I want to know God as my covering. I want to learn how to put my faith in God. Now, our faith in God in times of trials means that when we run to Him and we are willing to dwell in the secret place, and what is the secret place? Well, the secret place speaks of a covering, a sheltering, or a protection. That takes me again back to some of the history that is found in the story of Moses. Remember, as Moses leads the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, as they begin to make their journey to the land of promise before they messed everything up, God manifested His presence by giving to the children of Israel a covering, a cloud by day, a fire by night. This was their covering. They were abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. They never had to doubt whether God was with them. All they had to do was look at the cloud. All they had to do was look at the fire. And they knew, they knew that this was God's covering. Matter of fact, this is what we actually find in Psalm 105, Psalm 105, verse 39. The psalmist writes, He spread a cloud for a covering and fire to give light in the night. So note if you will, the cloud and the fire were God's coverings, God's sheltering, God's protection, and it always gave them the assurance of God's presence in their midst. And so, the secret place is in fact the covering that God gives to those who having set their love upon Him and knowing Him by name, have run to in a time of trials. Now the psalmist says that being under the shadow of the Almighty results in two things. Number one, God becomes our refuge and number two, God becomes our fortress. Our refuge and our fortress. Now the word refuge speaks 
of God as being a shelter. Again, refuge is akin to the secret place. In our times of trials, we hide in God and thus are helped by God. We read in Proverbs 18, verse 10, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. So when we think of our God being our refuge, we begin to understand that God is asking us to do something that is most important. He is asking us to trust Him. To trust Him. Note in verse 2, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. Not just a God or some God. No, the psalmist is making this very personal. He is my God. And in Him will I trust. I would underline that in my Bible if I were you. In Him will I trust. When you are willing to trust God in times of trials, in times of difficulties, when you are willing to trust God, you begin to understand what it means to rest in the Lord. To rest in the Lord. Our problem is this. Instead of trusting God, we do everything in our power to try to make things better. And that never works out. God is always going to be challenging us to trust Him and not try to do on our own that which only God can do for us. I want to take you back again to the storyline of Moses. In Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4, again, I think you are seeing that as we study Psalm 91, I see the fingerprints of Moses and the story of Moses all over Psalm 91. So the psalmist is saying, he's my God, and in him I'm going to trust. I'm not going to try, I'm going to trust. In other words, he's learning how to rest in the Lord. Now with that in mind, I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 9. There remains, therefore, a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. You see, we cannot be trying and trusting at the same time. God wants us to learn how to rest in Him. Now, resting in Him means that we are going to exhibit belief in His Word. Go back to verse 3 of Hebrews chapter 4. For we which have believed do enter into rest. Drop down to verse 5. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, if, if, maybe you will trust him, maybe you won't. But God will certainly give us opportunities. God will certainly bring circumstances into our lives that will either call for us to believe him or we won't believe him. Now he goes on. And he says in verse 6, Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Note, the children of Israel would get into the land of promise. Not by way of trying, they would get into the land of promise by way of simply trusting God. The more 
they would trust and believe in God, the more they would rest in the Lord and they would come to know the battle is the Lord's. What kind of battle are you facing tonight? I know that a lot of people are hurting. A lot of people are looking towards the future with great uncertainty. This is a wonderful opportunity to stop trying and start trusting. Do you believe that God is strong enough, big enough, wise enough, compassionate enough to take care of you better than you can take care of yourself? You see, what he wants to do is he wants you, he wants me to give him our trials. He wants to prove himself to us. But we have to get out of the way. We have to get out of the way. See, that was the problem with the first generation of Hebrews as they approached the land of promise. Somehow they got the idea that it was left up to them to make things work. And finally they came to that conclusion, we're just not able. We're just not able. But there were two men who had an entirely different attitude. Joshua and Caleb. Yes, Joshua and Caleb understood what the other ten were saying. Yes, we're not able. There are giants. There are walled cities. In other words, the circumstances are all stacked against us. But there's one thing that we must always remember. If God be for us, who can be against us? And that was the thing that changed the attitude of Joshua and Caleb. And these two men were ready to take God at His word. They were ready to rest in the Lord. Sad to say, the majority won, and that first generation missed out on their inheritance in the land of promise. Back in Hebrews chapter 3, God tells us how he felt about that first generation. He says in verse 10, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation. And said, they always err in their heart. And they have not known my ways. See, that's, that's why I say verse 14 is the key verse in Psalm 91. Once we come to that place where we set our love upon Him, and we come to know Him in a personal way, then, with knowing Him, we know what He wants and we know what He doesn't want. We know what pleases Him and we know what doesn't please Him. In other words, we have a sense of direction that if left to ourselves, we will never come to. He goes on, he says in verse 11, So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. Oh, how sad it was this first generation had faith enough to follow God out from Egypt, but they refused to have faith enough in God to follow God into the land of promise. Unbelief sees their hearts. The problem was they thought they had to do what only God could do. And then we read these words. Verse 15. While it was said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. 
They did not enter into God's rest. Why? Because they would not believe God. And what was true of them is just as true of us today. God is going to put us in sets of circumstances where either we're going to run to Him and He is going to become our refuge, our shelter, our covering, or we're going to stay from Him and try to do the best we can. And God says, that grieves my heart. That grieves my heart. So back in Psalm 91, the psalmist says, I trust in Him. And trusting in Him, I know Him as my refuge, but I also know Him as my fortress. God is our refuge, and God is our fortress. Now the word fortress that is presented here in Psalm 91 verse 2, the word fortress speaks of a castle, or literally a strong place. A strong place. Now again, all of this is personified in God Himself. All of this is just simply metaphors of the relationship that God wants to have with His people. When His people are facing times of trials, if His people will run to the Lord instead of running away from the Lord. You know, bad times will either make us, as believers, better or bitter. It's always been that way. It always will be that way. And especially as we're going through these difficult times, we have to ask ourselves the question, is our faith growing stronger or is our faith beginning to falter? Are we trusting in the Lord or are we out there trying to make matters better as far as we're concerned? So God is personified to those who will trust Him as being a fortress, as being a refuge. Now note, if you will, in verse 3, for those who find the Almighty as their refuge and their fortress, and they find this to be the case because they're trusting and not trying, they are assured of deliverance. In verse 3, surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler, and from the noisome pestilence. Now this is interesting. The psalmist marks out two things. He marks out, first of all, deliverance from a person. This person is identified as the fowler. The one who would set traps. The one who would catch prey. Suddenly, unexpectedly. But not only does the psalmist find deliverance from a person, but he also speaks of deliverance from a pestilent. Now the word pestilent, when you get over into the New Testament, is the word for disease. May I return to the story of Moses once again? God, as He is entering into that covenant relationship with the nation of Israel, He marries the nation there at Mount Sinai. He becomes husband. The nation becomes wife. He sets before the nation a series of blessings and a series of cursings. He says, you need to choose. You can choose the blessing or you can choose the cursing. You can choose life or you can choose death. But one of the blessings that he promised if they would trust and obey, trust and obey, one of the blessings is marked out this way by God. I will put none of these diseases upon thee. 
the diseases that God used to inflict judgment upon the Egyptians, God said, if you will trust me, if you will obey me, if you will follow me, I will ensure that you will not be taken by the diseases that I sent into the land of Egypt. What a word of comfort, especially in the time in which we are living. God knows what we're facing. There's nothing that has ever surprised Him. And God knows what the cure is. And I do believe that if we as God's people would pray and ask God to touch some researcher, some lab worker, some doctor, and uh, give him the knowledge or her the knowledge uh, that God could send a cure. And that's what we ought to be praying for. But it's interesting the God who is our refuge is also the God who is our fortress. And He protects us from people and He even protects us from the pestilent. And so, the perils of life, though they come suddenly and they come unexpectedly, God is never caught unawares. So speaking of both the refuge and the fortress, the idea that we must not miss is this. The closer we are willing to get to God, the better off things will be. You see, back in verse 1, he that dwells, he that dwells, look at verse 4, he shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings thou shalt trust. Note the word dwell. Too many are just willing to come for a visit. God doesn't want us to come for a visit when times are tough. No, He wants us to come and to dwell. What does it mean to dwell? It means to abide. To abide. You see, the secret place under the shadow of the Almighty points to the protection and the provision that God offers to those who are willing to abide, to come close to Him. You see, it's our communion with God which gives us a great confidence in God. You see, where faith is exercised, fear must exit. Paul wrote, writing to Timothy, he reminds Timothy, Timothy, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And so if you and I are willing to come close, and James puts it this way, if we draw nigh to him, he will draw nigh unto us. If we're willing to do that, then look at verse 4. We find that God is willing to cover us with his feathers and draw us up under his wings. Closeness. And, and, and here we see uh, the image of the eagle is in view. This would take us back to a passage such as Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 11. Listen to these words. As an eagle stirs up her nest, flutters over her young, spreads abroad her wings, takes them, bears them upon her wings. You, you can see the intimacy here uh, of the eagle taking care of her babies. And that's the imagery that, that God is, is giving to us. God says, I, I want to be like that eagle. I want to uh, draw you into a safe dwelling place. And, and I want to spread my, my feathers over you. I want to give you protection. And I want to draw you under my wing. I want to give you comfort. It's this same image that Jesus used of himself as we find in Matthew 23, verse 37. Jesus painted himself like a mother hen 
wishing to gather her chicks under her wings. Listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew 23, verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stone them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thee together even as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you would not. You would not. And again, going back to Moses. Moses reminded the Hebrews of God's protection and provision as we read these words from Exodus 19, verse 4. Moses told the people, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. So Moses is quoting the words of God himself. God says, I lifted you up on my wings. And I brought you unto myself. And so, in our times of trials, we can rest in the Lord. We can allow Him to protect and provide for us, all the while understanding what God wants to be. In verse 4, and I close, He wants to be our shield and our buckler our shield, and our buckler. He wants to be that strong tower into which we, as His children, are willing to run into in our times of trials, tribulations. What God is simply saying to us is this. I'm there. I'm there. Will you meet me? In your time of need, will you come to me? Will you rest in me? Will you allow me to be God? And I suppose as we find ourselves at this present stage, that this is the great challenge that many are going to have to face. For many, it might be a great time to renew their relationship with God. To learn new things about God. Who He is. What He can do. You see, when you think of all the experiences that you read about concerning Moses, as you read Psalm 91, you can see a reflection of what he says is due what he learned as he went through his times of trials and tribulations. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we do thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you, Father God, that you have such a way to speak to our hearts and minds. Father, I pray that the Spirit of God would take this lesson that we have seen from Psalm 91, verses 1 through 4. And Lord, use these words to rekindle our love, refresh our faith, and Lord, replenish our willingness to trust you. In times like this, I'm so glad that I know the one who is above all things, the one who can do all things. I'm so glad that I know Jesus as my Savior. And Father God, I pray for that one who may be listening to this broadcast. And Lord, they don't know you. They're out, Lord, in life struggling all alone. Our friends and our family can do only so much for us. But with God, all things are possible. Lord, maybe this would be a true turning point for many. I pray that it will. And Lord, I'd like to end this prayer with the following blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.